In this video, we will discuss tools to reduce scatter radiation. Scatter radiation is completely random and lays down a blanket of exposure over an entire area of an image. It reduces subject contrast and is detrimental to our radiographic images. Gustav Bucky invented a device called a grid to absorb scatter radiation produced in the patient's body. Because of this, the grid device is placed between the patient, which is the source of scatter, and the image receptor. A grid is a flat rectangular device that contains thin lead foil strips and radiolucent spacers. The lead strips are 0.005 inches thick or five thousandths of an inch thick. Here we see a cross-sectional view of a portion of a grid. The lead strips and spacers are alternated. Some grids are located inside the table or upright bucky where you don't see them while other grids can be attached to a specific size image receptor. The basic principle of how grids work is simple. The lead foil strips are vertical or nearly vertical to match the path in which the x-ray should travel to the image receptor. The radiolucent spacers allow the remnant x-rays those that have passed through the patient to reach the image receptor unobstructed, while the scattered X-ray photons, which have been deflected in all directions, are absorbed by the thin foil lead strips and prevented from reaching the image receptor and degrading the resulting image. Please note that the image here is not to scale and only meant to demonstrate the principle of how a grid works. There are many variations in grids. Some grids are stationary and do not move. Because of this, the lead foil strips, although quite small, can be slightly seen on the resulting radiograph. The visualization of the strips is considered noise on our image and is undesirable because there is a slight loss of radiographic information in the areas where the lead strips absorbed non-scattered x-rays. These types of grids are utilized for mobile radiography and performing cross-table lateral projections, as well as unconventional projections such as those required by some trauma situations. To reduce the visualization of grid lines, Dr. Hollis Potter invented a moving grid that actually moved during the exposure. When the rotor button is engaged, the grid inside the table or upright bucky begins to move continuously, but only a small amount of movement back and forth. Because of this movement, the lines are blurred, but the scatter radiation is still blocked by the lead strips. Modern grids have come a long way and are capable of attenuating 80 to 90 percent of all scatter radiation. Other grid variations include how the lead strips are arranged. A parallel grid has strips that are vertical and parallel to one another, while a focused grid has the lead strips at a slight angle to better align to the divergence of the X-ray beam. This is called canting of the lead strips and is common in most modern day grids. Grids can also vary in the direction the grid strips run. A long dimension grid is the most common grid and the lead strips run the length or long direction of the grid. A short dimension grid is one in which the lead strips run the short distance or width of the grid. Short dimension grids are useful in landscape mobile chest radiography on larger patients since the angle of the central ray is often not able to be perpendicular to the gridded image receptor, but instead angled downward or caudal. This caudal angle will work with the lead strips rather than against the lead strips. When we look at grids, it is helpful to know how effective they are. Not all grids are created equal. You should know that the spacer size determines the grid's efficiency in cleaning up scatter. As the spacer size is decreased or narrowed, the amount of scatter radiation able to make it past the grid is decreased as well. This is because X-ray photons directed at a greater angle will be absorbed by the lead strips. This is known as the effective angle of penetration. Grid ratio is the best way to determine a grid's efficiency. The relationship between height and width of the inner spaces between the lead foil strips determines how much scatter radiation is able to pass through the grid. You need to memorize that grid ratio equals H over D, where H is the height of the inner space and D is the width of the inner space, also stated the distance between the lead strips. Another term to be familiar with is grid frequency. Grid frequency is the number of lead strips counted per inch and ranges from 60 to 200 lines per inch. The common range that we see in the clinical setting ranges from 85 to 103 lines per inch. Both the grid ratio and the grid frequency are often listed on the grid label. Another detail often listed on the grid label is the grid radius, 
This is the effective distance a focus grid can be utilized. The range of SIDs are listed so the technologist knows at what source to image receptor distance range is feasible for the grid to be effective. The two most commonly manufactured grids are based on the two most commonly employed SIDs, 40 inches and 72 inches. In this example, we see that the grid will work at an SID range from 36 inches to 44 inches. This means the grid radius is 36 to 44 inches. Bucky factors are helpful tools for radiographers in determining change in MAS when employing or changing a grid. From this table, we can see that when we are going from a tabletop exposure, using no grid, to a gridded exposure, the Bucky factor rounded to the nearest whole number is 4 for the 8 to 1 ratio, the 10 to 1 ratio, and the 12 to 1 ratio. What this means is that you would multiply your MAS value by 4 when you transition from a tabletop exposure to a gridded exposure. So based on this table, if you perform a knee radiograph at 80 kVp at 2 MAS tabletop, what would you change your technique to if you had to repeat and add a grid with a ratio of 10 to 1? You would increase your mass to 8 and perform the projection using 80 kVp at 8 MAS now that you have added a grid. This is one example of how grid factors can simplify exposure conversions for technologists. Whether in the table bucky or upright bucky or attached to an image receptor, grids should be utilized when part thickness is greater than 13 centimeters. However, you may see some older references state part thickness is greater than 10 centimeters require a grid. As the part thickness increases, the grid ratio utilized should also increase. Large field sizes, such as 14 by 17 inches, may require a grid even if the part is less than 13 centimeters. This is because larger field size means there is more tissue being exposed. It is more spread out rather than stacked, but causes scatter nonetheless, and a grid will need to be employed to clean up the scatter and restore the contrast of the resulting image. Another factor in grid utilization is using very high KVP settings. Technologists should know that high KVP paired with increased tissue will result in increased scatter reaching the IR and a grid is then needed. The exception to this rule is the chest due to the large amount of space filled with air within the lungs. However, be aware that improper centering and collimation is even more detrimental when radiographing the chest without a grid. Inclusion of the arm tissue and abdominal tissue is counterproductive and will cover the image with scatter fog. Technologists need to use their best judgment when employing grids and remember that typical guidelines do not apply to pediatric patients. An abdominal radiograph typically requires a grid, but would not be required for a pediatric abdominal projection due to the smaller part size. As we saw in an earlier example, grids increase patient dose, so when a grid is not necessary, we should not include it when performing the radiographic projection. As you may already have guessed, grids require a certain amount of precision to be used effectively. When alignment is incorrect, grid cutoff is the result. The first rule in using a grid is that the central ray and grid must be perpendicular. Additionally, the central ray must be directed to the center of the grid. The divergent X-ray beams interacting with the lead strips will be absorbed otherwise. The source to image distance, or SID, must be appropriate for the grid. In other words, the SID needs to be within the designated grid radius. All of these alignment issues cause grid cutoff, where the necessary remnant beam is being absorbed by the lead strips and information is missing as a result. Many times grid cutoff appears as a bright area or margin on the radiograph and grid lines can be distinguished. When grid cutoff is caused by off-centering or the CR and grid not being perpendicular to one another, the grid cutoff is seen mostly on one aspect of the image. When the improper SID is used and causes grid cutoff, the brightness is symmetrical. From this video, you should understand what grids are and what they do you should be able to differentiate between the types of grids. You should also be able to discuss grid effectiveness and what affects it, as well as recall the grid ratio definition and formula. You should understand grid terminology and definitions. Know when to use a grid and how to use it properly. And lastly, you should be able to identify grid cutoff and its causes.